Hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Leila Darrenville. I'm a mixed heritage woman with big hair and a big smile. I'm founder of Town and Weir Cultural Freelancers, a freelance creative producer, I work for Northern Roots, and I am the vice chair of Newcastle's Cultural Compact. Thank you to everyone who's come along today for what I think is gonna be a really interesting and insightful, insightful event. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be able to welcome our speakers today. In person, we have Izzy Finch and Casper Dye, and we have a recording from Jenny Young. The event is in partnership with Newcastle University, the What Next movement dedicated to bring, bringing people together from across the cultural sector to debate and shape the future of arts and culture and Tyne and Weir cultural freelancers supporting freelancers and independents to remain at the centre of the cultural conversation in the Northeast and beyond. When I first approached Newcastle University with the idea of an event looking at cultural leadership, it was really clear that I wanted the event to look at leadership in its broadest form, moving away from highlighting those who head up organisations and moving towards recognising the leadership that lies across the sector. The number of people that we wanted to invite to speak today well exceeded the space and time that we have had to fill. So please do watch this space as I think there, uh, that we would all like to do more with the topic, especially producing content in different formats to ensure that people can engage in any way they feel comfortable. So on that note, um, I'm going to pass on to Izzy Finch and then we'll hear from Casper Dye and Jenny Young. Um, so my name is Izzy um, and I'm an arts practitioner, producer and musician. Um, I work at the Customs House where I lead on Our So Sui, which is a queer-led LGBTQ arts group for young people. One of the Lads, which is a physical theatre and storytelling project which explores masculinity and gender. Um, and I also work part-time at the New Bridge Project as project manager for Create Disrupt, which is a, a brand new strand of arts development for creatives who have not been to university, um, but who are looking to take those first steps to starting a career in the arts. I'm also a freelance musician um, and a project musician for Gem Arts, where I work specifically with uh, resettled Syrian young people in Gateshead. So um, one of the largest projects that I work on at the Customs House is um, the Takeover, which is an annual opportunity for a team of young people who have varying levels of arts experience um, to come and program, market and deliver their dream five day festival. Um, so on the screen, I've just put a picture of our Takeover team from this year on the right and the program of activity that they uh, put on for this year's festival. Um, so this year it was um, a huge risk because obviously we had additional um, issues because we weren't quite out of lockdown yet. Um, something that we do with Takeover every year um, that we think is really important is that we have paid opportunities for young people um, and they are call outs um, and they're embedded in the project every year and we try and make that um, something that develops and grows. Um, so uh, a bit of background about me, my life um, as a young person, um, from the age of sort of 13 onwards, I was involved in lots of different arts projects as a participant and then a young leader and then as an audience member as well. So I, I've always felt very comfortable in arts environments and on arts projects. And this was um, pivotal for me, really, in terms of developing a career as an arts practitioner. Um, this is a picture of me and someone who some of you may know, Bex Mather. Um, so I'm 15 in this picture on the right and I'm at the Sage Gates head doing a youth leadership cohort. Um, so Bex was an extremely influential person for me and um, one of a handful of practitioners who believed in me, took uh, creative risks and eventually um, this led to paid opportunities when I was around 15 as an arts worker. Um, so this time really shaped my core values and it's something that I now bring into every creative project that I lead on. Um, I think I was someone who felt that grassroots movement of being nurtured as a young person by participating in arts programs to then becoming a young leader and benefiting from meaningful paid opportunities and recognition and a platform in the arts from a really young age, as well as feeling very comfortable in art spaces and in a creative environment.
Um, so I left home when I was 16 and I left school when I was 18 and I didn't go to university after I did my A-levels and I didn't do an undergrad. Um, so from my late teens to early 20s, I worked in hospitality, played in bands and worked off and on freelance in the arts. Um, and it was a slow burn building that up to being um, a full time career. Um, and for a long time, I don't think I really knew what a realistic or viable career path in the arts looked like. Um, I didn't know that there was so many possibilities of different um, arts worker opportunities. Um, I even would apply for jobs that said a degree was desirable when I didn't have one, but I had experience. Um, and I think that that is something that as arts workers, we should interrogate what we are asking of people when we put out a call out, whether that is for participants or for workers, and how we make this career path look not just accessible, but welcoming. Um, so it's only within the past year that I did um, embark on university study. So um, last year I completed an MSc in inequality in society. Um, and I'm a queer third generation immigrant and someone who obviously hadn't previously engaged in further education. And the opportunity to apply theory, discipline and research to my own creative practice and my personal commitment to addressing social justice was revolutionary. Um, and I do now passionately believe that there isn't one right path um, for everyone. And I can see that all the aspects of my identity before I did um, my master's, all the things that I felt shameful about are the very things that make me the right person to be doing this work and to be researching these inequalities that surround identity and the arts. And I think I have extremely complicated feelings about academia, um, particularly the way that we can view it as currency. And although I loved um, my masters and um, you know, it was extremely um, beneficial and useful and I, I learned so much, it's a shame that it's only now that I've completed it that I can feel that sense of validation that it wasn't necessary to make me, um, for, me for me to have a seat at the table in terms of being an arts worker. Um, so these are just some pictures of a takeover this year. Um, so I think, as we all probably know, most arts venues know that they have a very specific demographic when it comes to programming. So this means that um, by inviting young people like we do for takeover to come and program our whole calendar for five days, it is a big risk. And particularly this year, I think it felt like um, it had more challenges than usual because we were in the final stages of lockdown lifting. Um, the team had been meeting online. Some of them had never even met before in real life. Um, we knew that numbers would have to be restricted for all events. We had to do testing. Um, so it was a challenge. Um, but these young people had very levels of arts experience um, in terms of leadership or even participating in the arts. Um, and I think this is significant because years of neoliberal ideology have led us to a very specific place where not only are creativity and culture not economically valued by the state, but we are made to feel like the arts sector and arts opportunities are a privilege and a luxury and not just a right. And unfortunately, this is something that I see a lot when working with young people, particularly when they're around the sort of 18 years old mark. Um, because they express feelings of guilt or shame um, by participating or interacting in the arts because, and I think if we really unpack why that is, it's because neoliberalism has taught us that the arts isn't upgrading our human capital and therefore isn't a serious priority worth investing in because we're not actively contributing to capitalism. Um, but I also think having said that, this is why it's extremely important that we continue to create paid opportunities for those who might not be experienced arts leaders or our young people or people from communities that have been historically left out of those conversations. Um, and that's something that we embed in Takeover every year and something that I try to embed in every project that I do um, to ensure that young people can see the arts as a viable career. Um, so this year's team um, have grown together and um, just in these pictures I can already see who potentially might be the young leaders for next year's cohort. I think um, something else that is um, 
directly from uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who um, sort of coined the term intersectionality. Um, and within Black Feminist Thought, there's this idea, which I think is really important to keep at the forefront of arts projects, about what is knowledge and who has created what we perceive to be knowledge and how this is connected to the arts, because what we consider to be great art and what we consider to be a meaningful arts project have historically been um, created by a very specific demographic. And I think we have a duty to consistently interrogate that and what that means. So um, what do we need from cultural leadership to build back better and with equity? I think that um, we'll all be aware that arts sectors and arts workers are only becoming um, increasingly precarious. Uh, we must not accept or perpetuate the ideology that arts are a privilege and something that can be sustained on gratitude and passion alone. Um, we all consume the arts and we must invest in it, but we also must continue to take creative risks and continue to hold the door open for those who may not have always had a seat at the table or been part of those conversations. Um, I think that we've all, especially if we are an Arts Council England funded, if we've ever had money from Arts Council, we've all heard this um, expression about cultural diversity, but this is a resource that I recently came across where it talks about cultural humility and I think this is really, this final column on the um, right is really where we should all be striving to be around cultural humility and um, adopting a co-created approach where we continue to reflect on and interrogate and challenge who has historically been excluded or not involved in our um, leadership and in our uh, projects and activity. And within that, it's also understanding how barriers to involvement um, in the arts and even in society are rarely mutually exclusive um, and while we do this work it's never going to be a finished product and we must continue to um, be adaptive and responsive in our approach to considering how we build back better. Um, so just to finish off um, I think that <laughs> art is always political and that art is for everyone and that we all have um, a, a duty to hold the door open and to ensure that everybody has that opportunity for involvement because the safe spaces that give marginalized communities opportunities and a platform for self-expression and to be validated and mentored they all contribute to the adaptive resilience that is lacking in many communities and workspaces and organizations and schools and colleges and um, we have a responsibility if we're in an influential role to continue to shape and support and create um, innovative opportunities for participation. And that's me. So thank you for listening. I put my email on there in case anyone did want to email me a question that you don't want to ask in here or get in touch about anything. I'm more than happy for you to do so. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Casper Dye. I'm a PhD researcher at North Rome University um, researching Hindu diasporic um, identities across Trinidad and Canada, um, all part of the way they make heritage in different contexts in the diaspora. I'm also a senior researcher um, working on the Multicultural Archive Project, the first collated archive of Black um, culture in the Northeast. Um, it's an ongoing project. And I'm also, um, I work across many community and voluntary sector organizations um, of all different type. Um, and it's a really important part of my work. And today I'm going to really present um, a Black um, woman feminist perspective. So following on nicely from Izzy Finch um, before. Um, and I'm going to talk about what decolonization means in my work and how it straddles across theory and practice in my various roles within and outside the community, the university. I just want to hark back to last summer, the context of the pandemic and BLM movement, which came to the fore with the murder of George Floyd and the added urgency and reckoning um, needed for all forms of institutional and structural um, addressing all forms of institutional and structural racism and inequalities in our institutions. There were long-standing calls, however, there were long-standing calls to social, cultural and institutional change from over 25 years since the murder of Stephen Lawrence and the McPherson Report, the Race Relations Amendment Act in 2000 and the Equality Act of 2010. 
The fear, anxiety, feelings of some unsafeness and exposure heightened awareness on a global scale. However, the reality was that George Floyd was just one amongst men in a long list of black bodies, which reflected deeply embedded historical racism and inequalities in society that privileges power. It was and is an endemic of racism in the pandemic. In the barrage of anti-racist statements, which followed from institutions nationally and globally, the bleakness of the present aroused opportunities for hope and action. For me, it was a process of deep, well, a process of awakening, of deep observation and self-education, which followed beyond theories, but understanding the realities of how it plays out and why, especially in its implicit forms. At my university, I emailed a very senior level staff member and questioned its credibility as a higher education institution, fostering learning, debate, and well being within its community, the society, and the wider world. Of concern was the duty of care that it needed to offer students, particularly Black and racialized students and staff, a safe space to deal with potential anxieties and trauma beyond mere references to dormant. EDI policies, which I argued, showed a deep lack of respect as complacent firewalls rather than more active application of these policies and other policies in the current situation. What were the actions to care and comfort to its communities? Just to clarify, there was a statement released by my university, as with many other institutions across the land. And globally. My questions and concerns were centered around future actions, though, duty of care to ensure both Black and non-Black staff and students' well-being, its efforts in understanding the impact of the event on them, the workable tools and reporting mechanisms to monitor and address race, race and, and hate crime, racism and hate crimes, and what is needed to affect change in the long term. I argue that any H higher education institution that aspires towards global learning, innovation and change that ultimately impacts on making our world a better place for humanity and for ourselves really, needs to see the moment as an opportunity for movement. It is only by hashtag taking on today that we can truly hashtag take on tomorrow as its corporate strap line suggests. What felt equally exposing to me was the institution to its external community, the partners and participants on the project I was working on, a Arts and Humanities Council research funded research engagement project, the archives project, exploring the history of cultural activism in the Northeast, bridging partnerships between our black cultural sector and the university, collating and developing the first black archives as I mentioned before. Itself challenges race and race representation and inequalities. Of concern was also the time and energies to build up strong relationships of trust, these communities and the institution's position, re reflecting the level of its commitment to addressing racism internally and in our society. It has deep impact on the equality of these relationships and public engagement with our partners, valuable to research and research impact. This work is enriching, but also extractivist. As a, black, as a black student and staff, it's particularly isolating and exhausting experience. And the leadership responsibilities that ensue at these levels, sometimes being the only black woman in the room. With the formulation of the BAME network and belonging to a black led woman's community charity, Sangini, the latter, the latter though external provide a safe space for support for me. These two entities inhabit by and for approaches, particularly black feminist and womanist approaches. In these contexts, decolonization for me is not a state of emergency to accelerate race, race, race inequality. In the race equality, in the, and I'll just say that again. In these contexts, decolonization for me is not a state of emergency to accelerate race, in, race inequality. In the undoing of acts of inhumanities of the past, it is not a new concept, it's neither a moment for, a moment nor a movement of undoing or making new, but a process of rediscovery and approaches, homage to actions, for change to European centric models and a culturally incompetent world and society that we live in. It is not a starting point. It needs to consider small, big acts to shift dynamics of power and privileges. The return, the process of return and recourse tells a different narrative from the perspective of those from below the, graf the grassroots to be listened to and activated by those 
who serve us at the top. It is a space for civilizations and humanities in the quest for different truths, uncovering people's lives and deaths, struggles and triumphs of love, hate and indifference that has made our world. Its histories, claims and talents retold at the point at where this converges and dishonors. Decolonization's many manifestations have been traction over the last few years, especially for those living in a world that does not make sense, that is both complex as much as it is complicit. In its representation, it needs to hit the advanced cause for change and reforms to structures, systems, and systems that continue to bound black bodies and people of color and those of other ethnicities who suffer inequalities. Calls to decolonize institutions are calls for a new wave for a new liberation and self-determination in a future ready world. But as, East, uh, but as, but as Eve Tuck argues, decolonization is not a metaphor. My leadership journey in decolonization has been both a personal and a collective one, collective one of self-education and understanding the current political ter terrain and its aftermath of decolonizing my mind my own mind, check my own privileges and fragilities across race, class, ableism, and so on. It's about, it's of resilience work at Northumbria and applying the learning and identifications to new, the nuances of power felt more so during the pandemic. I have developed a few provocation mantras to use, of course, um, of thinking through things, really thinking through things, change, what does it look like? The fact that it does, that, that it is about process, not product. Who is in the space and who is not in the space and why? And how do I ensure the, ensure the provision of space for different voices to be heard at all levels and all levels of decision make, making? How do I influence change I want to see today in small, big and better ways? One year, one year and indeed, one year and indeed in my lifetime, I've seen recently a feel. I feel a few positive steps that have made that has been made by race equality charters and so on, and the good work of my colleagues. I do acknowledge and respect, but transformational change changes slow attitudes, behaviors, actions, institutional, cultural policies. Wow, it's a lot. For my black elders and allies and communities, whilst they welcome and feel hopeful, they also see it all. They've also seen it all before, wanting more actual change from over the last 50 years. There is a new generation though with new soul, wanting to bring new perspectives and a new language, but it is more than language. It takes meaningful and sustainable action as hostilities are heightened in our world today. Really no pressure and we stand with you. I acknowledge that every experience of black women leadership have commonalities. It is not homogenous, but also different in nuance in its complexity. Whilst I do not necessarily advocate working across multiple levels and platforms, it is the timing of these opportunities which provide a fresh launch pad to bring race and inequalities to the fore and intersectionality to the fore. As a black woman advancing race equity development and everyday is a Advancing race equity development is an everyday part of my existence, lived experience, research and work, and we may still be in a moment of change, which must be seized while still fresh, even though it feels that the temperature is cooling. This is especially in light of the recent Commission for Race and Ethnic Disparities civil report, which has denied the existence of institutional racism. How, how may this impact on resources need for transformational change, institutional, structural, systemic? Has there been many higher education institutions denouncing the civil report? And, and do the lack of state, these statements denouncing this show a lack of attention and continuity in this work? The labor, the labor involved in anti-racist and equality work disproportionately affects black staff and students who need the necessary tools to build resilience for fear of mental stress. They are exposed to burnout due to stress and trauma caused by implicit racism in higher education and other institutions and having to relive experiences, having to always be on the alert and energized to call things out. Black life support in higher education and other institutions, still very poor. Monitoring race and equality, what are the channels, who monitors, how effective are they doing, are they in doing so? Very poor. Who would you turn to? My centering on self-care and self-value on the philosophies of black feminism, which upholds the black women, which upholds black women are inherently valuable and their liberation is a necessity, not an ad adjunct to somebody else's 
but our own hum human need for our own dependence and autonomy. Black feminist theory contends that Black women have an acute understanding of negative impacts of sex and racism and class discrimination, all aspects of the same systems of hierarchy, which bell hooks call, which bell hooks call imperialist, white, supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Due to their interdependency, they combine to create something that more than experience in racism and sex and independently, the experience of being a black woman there in any capacity, much less in one of leadership in higher education and most white led institutions in society as a whole cannot be grasped in terms of being black or even in terms of being a woman, but must be seen through an intersectional lens as coined by Kimberly um, Crenshaw in 89. Being black and being a woman, um, are intersecting identities which deepen, reinforce one another, that which deepen, reinforce one another and potentially lead to aggravated forms of inequality. Thank you for listening. Hi everybody, my name is Jenny Young. I'm a director at Blue Cabin and I'm really chuffed to be here today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, so I'm gonna share some slides and talk you through them. So hello, it's lovely to be here with you today. My name's Jenny. I am white, have dark brown, green hair, blue eyes and glasses. I am founder and director of Blue Cabin. Thanks so much for inviting us along today to speak. We really, really appreciate it. In prepping for today, it felt important and appropriate that I didn't plan this presentation on my own. Leadership in Blue Cabin is everywhere. So I asked for everybody's help. So who are we? Blue Cabin is nearly five years old. We've recently transitioned from being a community interest company into a charity, and we're based in Gateshead and work regionally and nationally. We have two and a half employees, a board of six, three associate project managers, 11 associate artists, four producers, a PR consultant, a design agency, and a filmmaker podcaster. That's 27 creative freelancers. You might recognize some of their lovely faces here. The drawings are mine because I couldn't find photos of some people and I didn't want to leave anyone out. We work across the Northeast with a purposeful focus on care experienced children and young people and the adults in their lives. And the places and spaces we work alongside them include care experienced young men in Diabolt prison, birth mothers who've had their children removed from them during COVID-19, and care experienced children and young people to help them explore their life stories. Our work is focused on transforming outcomes for them and alongside them through creative activities with artists. And we work with key partners such as local authorities to achieve this. I'm going to share with you some of our 2018, 2021 business plan objectives. In blue, you'll see our original aims and the black figures for how we're getting on with them. We couldn't have imagined exceeding these targets three years ago when we originally set them. It's important to note that all of our work have relationships at the heart. We achieve this through facilitating creative experiences and working in partnership to change systems which might need improving. And we gather evidence of impact to influence national policy. We do see relationships with people and organizations as key to bringing about change. More about how we do this later. When prepping for this presentation, we thought about the question, what does leadership look like in Blue Cabin? And for me, this video really demonstrates that well. Wait a minute, wait a, oh, wait a minute. Right, welcome to Nicola and Michelle's Tuesday Chinwag. How to share audio. <laughs> go, Michelle, go. Yes, computer to share. Three days later. Yes! <laughs> Michelle and Nicola are associate artists with Blue Cabin and we've worked alongside them now for nearly four years. 
in the video Nick supporting Michelle to prep for a session and how to use tech um, as part of our creative life story work program. And what's really clear to me from this video that they shared with me via WhatsApp after they'd recorded it is the care and respect they have for one another, the fun and laughter that's part of every conversation they have, the time they give to one another to learn something new together and the support they provide. This space wasn't facilitated by Blue Cabin or organised by us, they found it themselves. And when I asked our team and associates and partners to help me talk with you today about leadership, what I saw in the interaction between Michelle and Nick was mirrored back to me in the words and phrases people shared. They include honesty, respect, support, laughter, attentiveness, love, flexibility, trust, clarity, dedication, and of course, tea. Lizette talks about leadership in Blue Cabin like being a warm picnic blanket. Leadership looks like a giant picnic blanket, space for everything you need, woven with care, additions tacked onto the side, but with love and secure stitching. All are always welcome. You feel safe while you're sitting there. You feel like someone has taken the time to find the perfect shady spot and you will be well looked after. There is always someone sitting there to make sure you're okay. If they haven't seen you at the picnic, picnic blanket for a while they'll send a message and make sure you're okay. Training to sit on the blanket is paid and kind and glorious. You are never scared, worried or alone. Every time you are asked if you'd like to come to the blanket there's an offer of payment and it's always on time. The blanket feels like it's strong, flexible and there to give you a giant hug. Written large on this blanket are respect, kindness, care, ask and laughter. Emma explains that it's all about respect, consideration and being organised with no unreasonable deadlines. And Carol explains that love is a central factor and time is always on offer for conversations. So what are some of the key principles, values and approaches that we draw upon and how can they help to explain why leadership looks and feels as it does in Blue Cabin? Social pedagogy, which some of you may have already heard of, is essentially concerned with well-being, learning and growth. It's underpinned by the idea that each person has inherent potential, is valuable, resourceful and can make meaningful contributions to their wider community if we find ways of including them. And this is so much about why Blue Cabin is Blue Cabin. We try to hold an attitude of professional curiosity and critical self-reflection, foster relationships that respect human dignity and promote human rights, neutrality and well-being, develop and nurture an attitude of empathy and regard for people and cultures and the world of which we are part. ICA, you may have already heard of them too, work to enable people to bring about positive change and to influence constructively decisions that affect their lives. Values such as wholeness, respecting diversity and uniqueness of individuals, which encompasses mind, body and spirit. Making a difference by making a contribution as part of our individual life journeys and enabling others to do the same. And having a global perspective, not forgetting this, for all of our actions at the local, national and international levels are interconnected. And relational activism, making change happen through personal and informal relationships. Values within relational activism that can be practiced include being curious and connecting, examining everyday interactions and reciprocal story sharing. I was asked to think about building back better and I'm not sure if we would use the phrase building back better within our organisation. We do think that we need to move forward with real consideration and care of the journeys people have taken before and during the pandemic. Knowing people and understanding their stories will help us to move forward together. I hope we move forward with equity by drawing upon our underpinning values and principles. In discussing this with our team and associates and friend, Dawn has articulated beautifully what this looks like in the company. Course correction, not judgment. See, invite and challenge our team, not based upon what they've done, but what we know they can do. And based upon their latent abilities that we see in them, abilities that they may not be aware of just yet. A guide seeking to make transparent the knowledge in the room. We all hold a piece of the jigsaw. Engendering trust by telling the truth and doing what we say we will do. Gracefully accepting constructive feedback from our team members. 
when we make mistakes, which we do, own them, correct them and move on. Be kind. Be present. Being available to the present moment, helping us to discern team behaviours and provide compassionate feedback. Respond quickly in a crisis and stick with people until things are better for them. Ensure safe boundaries of confidentiality for the exchange of information and the building of mutual relationships. And being really mindful that we cannot and should not be a know-it-all organisation. Be happy to not be an authority on everything and we feel that this unleashes brilliance within the team. And then this last one comes from Nick Golightly, who you saw earlier. Don't be a dickhead. So in terms of key considerations for our entire organisation, in terms of how we think about things going forward for leadership in our organisation, we need to think about how we can continue to provide spaces for our team and associates to be together, reflect and learn. Time, budget, facilitation and valuing this because leadership is happening in all of these spaces all of the time and we are the whole team working together and moving forward. We need to think about practicing radical responsibility because unexpected does occur, we know that. And instead of letting it trying to set us back, we need to think together, what have we learned and what, if anything, will we do differently next time? And also for us, how can we work towards being a trauma-informed organisation? This includes paid for therapeutic supervision for artists, associates and staff. Thinking about being trauma-informed in every element of our organisation, from governance to operations, systems and practice, and understanding our role in supporting people to take care of themselves physically and emotionally too. Um, I'm always happy to have a chat and a cuppa if anybody would like that. Um, my email is jenny at weablucabin.com and thanks again for letting me share some of our thoughts and perspectives with regards to leadership.